So hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now a little tech roundup today. I used to call this the truth show but I dropped that name so I thought it was a bit contentious. But what the hell, we're bringing it back. Episode something of the truth show and let's have a little look at the latest tech that's been out on show recently. Starting off with the big one that you've been asking me about in the comments and on email and stuff. The new Super Record Wireless by Campagnolo. My first road bike group set was a Campi Veloce 9 speed. Um, but what can we say about this new one? Well, it's gone fully wireless, like kind of ETAP or AXS or whatever they're calling it, which is interesting because I thought components with external batteries were covered by SRAM's access patent. So whether they're paying royalties to SRAM or have bought a license from SRAM to use that, possibly, I'm not sure, I'll have to do a bit more digging. And then secondly, I mean, we can talk about this all day because inflation, but the price, four and a half thousand quid, horrific. Now, when you consider I built this very road bike up, which I consider to be a top, top-end road bike for about 4,000 quid. Yes, that was pre-inflation, pre-COVID, and I've got Dura Ace, it is 11-speed, but Dura Ace Di2. Who's going to spend four and a half thousand pounds on Campagnola group set? Well, a lot of people. A lot of rich, sorry, dads. Fair play to them. I'm kind of jealous. I'd quite like to have a bike with Campagnola on it, but I'd probably go for the old-school mechanical stuff. And it's a shame they're not doing rim or mechanical on this group set at all. One good thing, I've always vouched for the Campy AFS disc rotors. They stuck with them. They haven't even changed the design because they really work. I do find they get a bit of play in the rivets and I've had a lot of you guys contacting me since I uh, started promoting Campy AFS rotors about that play. And yes, it does seem to be a problem. I had two discs warranted by the shop that I bought them from because of it. And the new discs did exactly the same after a couple of months, but it didn't affect the braking. It was just a bit noisy. Anyway, what else? Uh, chains by Campagnola made by YBN like a really good chain factory in Taiwan. Some of the best chains on the market are made by them. Super hard steel. Just out on my zone one ride today. I hope you can hear me. I had a road bike TT last night and I've got a big mountain bike day tomorrow. So I'm just spinning the legs over. Right. Now the thing that I really don't like about this group set, okay, yes, there's the price, but we can go on to that until inflation comes down. It is the weird gear ratios. They seem to have done what SRAM Axis have done by limiting the size of the front chain rings. And they've actually limited the size of the rear cassette as well. So the maximum you can get on the back is a 1029. And the maximum you can get on the front is a 5034. Now, if you are remotely serious about kind of fast road riding or racing, or even just road bike TTs or something, a 5034 on the front is not gonna cut it. Um, and a 5010 as your biggest gear is quite inefficient in the 10 tooth. And what's, what, what's worse than that is your bottom climbing gear is a 3429, which is actually like pretty hard these days. On Shimano, you can go up to a 34 cassette really easily. I think the standard on the 12 speed is a 32 or a 34. And Shimano do offer everything still in much bigger chainring sizes. Now the skeptic in me says, why do they limit the chainring sizes? Why is Campy and SRAM limiting these chainring sizes? Well, when you consider the machining costs of a chainring go up with radius squared, a little bit bigger plate is a lot of extra money every year in material costs. And material costs since about 2019, if you look at stock prices of aluminium, even steel, stainless steel, anything, it has rocketed. It's come down a bit recently, but that's my skeptical view. But a 1029 on the back, that's just, that's rubbish. So I think the Italians are still holding on to this belief that, you know, like, if you're strong enough to have super record on your bike, you're strong enough to climb anything on the 29. You're strong enough to climb the Angler Reel on the 29. And it simply isn't the case. I mean, if you look at Rog and the Giro spinning away when everyone else is grinding and high cadence can win, although we'll, we'll ignore the fact that the one by chain dropping thing, I mean, that was like a marketing stunt gone wrong by dropping the chain, having the one by set up. And you could have easily got that set up on a two by ch chain ring with the right gear ratio. I still think a 34-34 would have been okay. But then he kind of saved it by winning. So it was a marketing stunt gone wrong that then went right. Anyway, very weird. So yeah, this, this whole thing about the Campy Super Record and then they're gonna obviously need a bigger chain ring for TT. So I'm gonna have to swap out some sort of custom for pros only. But I hate to tell you Campagnola, but if you're doing racing in the UK, there is a massive market for bigger chain ring group sets. Like if you go to any road bike TT, or any club TT, or even on TT bikes, people want biggest chain rings because they know about the efficiency gains. 
Now, just jumping into the edit quickly before Jesse from the Nero show gets triggered about my comments about the smaller rings being inefficient. I'm not just talking about the 10 tooth, I'm talking about the whole thing. So the small front chain rings and the small front gears on the back that you'll just be riding in all the time. Now let's be really conservative and say that combination of smaller rings is one watt less efficient. Considering a Grand Tour there's about 90 hours of pedaling, that's 324,000 seconds. If it's one watt less efficient, that's one joule every second. So that's 324,000 joules of mechanical output you need to make up. Now, considering the body isn't very metabolically efficient, that's about four or five extra gels you need to make up that 324,000 joule efficiency loss. Now, secondly, I want to mention this video. Chris King, the ultimate in bling, have entered the carbon wheel market. As you know, I am a bit of a carbon wheel fiend. I sort of seem to be the go-to now for the Jarman crew to send wheels to for testing. The stiffness protocol, the aero protocol, which I actually do on this very strip, um, seems to be the go-to. But anyway, I've not really had any big Western brands, apart from ones that get donated, so I've got a set of zips coming up. But I digress. Chris King have entered the wheel game, and they are claiming they've developed a carbon fibre in conjunction with a partner. I think they're called CSS, based in North America. A more sustainable approach to carbon fiber composites. So they've ditched the kind of thermo setting epoxy in favor of a thermo polymer, and they're mixing the carbon with a nylon resin instead of an epoxy resin. Now, what's the difference between a thermo set and a thermo plastic? A thermo set is basically like epoxy or polyester. If you try and burn it, it just chars, it doesn't melt. It doesn't really have that kind of breakdown like you would get in an easily uh, recyclable plastic like nylon does. Now nylon is a thermopolymer, it actually has a glass transition temperature of anywhere between 180 and 200 degrees, so you certainly won't be seeing this on a rim brake wheel set because it will melt, but they've developed a disc brake group set using a nylon resin, it's supposed to aid the decomposition and recyclability of the wheels a lot better. Now that's pretty cool because I've always said that carbon fiber products just aren't recyclable really apart from chopping them up and using them in bloody bitumen and asphalt and stuff like this and additives you can't really do a lot with a cured epoxy composite of carbon fiber but now they're using nylon I mean using nylon with carbon has been done for ages so if you injection mold of plastic like nylon you add a certain proportion chopped strands or long strand or short strand carbon fiber you can make very strong molded composites like your rear mech body. So uh, to take an Ultegra mech, the body of that is carbon fiber reinforced plastic. Now, they're doing it slightly different to that, they're not injection molding, they're still doing a sort of hand layup. And there's obviously a much more similar volume fraction of fibers like you would be in an in epoxy uh, carbon fiber composite, but you will pay a weight penalty. So I think their wheel set is 44 or 45 millimeters deep and it's above 1500 grams. Now, if you took a similar depth wheel set from Jarmen in China, like the Chinese wheels that are coming out now, they're getting 50, 50 mil wheel sets down to kind of 1250 grams. So for the nylon resin, you are paying a bit of a weight penalty, two to 300 grams, but it just depends how much you really want that sustainability kind of green tick on your, on your road profile as you are sipping your flat white at the cafe out of a waxed lined paper cup, which is very hard to recycle. Next thing on the list, DT have tried to reinvent the wheel by creating another new spoke, even though the DT Aero Light spoke is probably one of the best on the market. It's up there with a the CX Ray Strong Light Aero. They've now combined that Aero spoke with a round spoke, and now it has kind of a cross, uh, cross sectional area and called it the Revo Light. I don't really know why they've done this because the DT Aerolite spoke, you couldn't want more from a spoke than that gives. But they're now saying there's a, a, a higher strength spoke for mountain bike use or cyclocross use or gravel use. I mean, I've never snapped an Aerolite spoke. But yeah, they've just made another spoke to, to test their forging technology. And by forging some extra kind of profile into the spoke, I think they're trying to just realign even more grain structure throughout the length of the spoke. And, make a stronger spoke. I think it's a bit of a case of uh, trying to spend R&D budget for the year because I don't really think it's necessary, but it's nice to see them making another spoke because I love spokes. <laughs> right, I hope you can hear me okay and see me okay. Uh, I didn't adjust my tire pressures down after last night's road bike TT, so we are riding a bit of a bone rattler now on this cross country zone one ride. Next up, spotted at the Giro, uh, UAE team 
Team UAE or whatever they're called these days. We're using some new Carbon TI disc rotors, 160mm disc rotors. If you look closely, it actually looks like they're using a center lock adapter. So these discs are actually designed for six bolt. I've always said that center lock is a solution to a problem that didn't exist. But they're actually using a center lock adapter. So it seems a bit of a mess to be using this as a solution, really. Um, obviously they don't have Shimano as their disc sponsor. I'm not sure how they get away with that. Or well, they found problems with the ice tech rotors, me being one of those. Um, let's quickly get in the aero tucky. The aero turkey. So, yeah, why would you want the carbon center spider? Now, some people would say that it's a bad idea because you should use the spider as a heat sink. Well, I can tell you from some thermal modeling, and I'll try and drop some screenshots here. I've done a lot of thermal modeling on discs. The Spider actually doesn't take a lot of heat, or the spokes, even on a solid steel plate disc, doesn't actually take a lot of heat away from the brake track. And it's worse on a Spider because there's a real thermal bottleneck of the, where the rivet is, or the floating pin. It really restricts the heat flux, but yeah, it just seems a bit of a messy solution to use this, and then so you've got the brake track, solid steel, which is, solid steel is the best then riveted to the spider, and then you've got the center lock adapter in the middle, all seems a bit of a mess to be honest. I guess it's just a bling product. But well, that is the Carbon TI. That is the Carbon TI uh, disc spotted at the Giro. Next one, a bit of an odd one. You probably haven't heard of this because it hasn't really been picked up by any media, but I've been following this guy for about five years. Velo Veta. He's an engineer and triathlete that has developed an aerodynamic cycling shoe. Well, Good on him because the cycling shoe is a massive piece of the moving equation in terms of drag and he tried to reduce the drag of the shoe and the foot by basically making a long and slim last and kind of a novel um, release mechanism at the back and he hasn't used boas because obviously he'd have to pay a handsome royalty to use boas or a license to use boas I think or they are quite expensive I guess for low volume production, but he has got a wire system and a closure system all developed into the back of the heel, which you, which you kind of need to preset when you size the shoe. So I'll leave his YouTube channel in the description below. Check it out. Ask him any questions you may have. Um, I think it could do with some more exposure. Now the final thing I want to look at for the mountain bikers out there is the Cervelo kind of fixed suspension link. I think it's called the Link Lock, which they used at the XCO race a couple of weeks ago. And it's basically taking their new single pivot XC bike, which is a very lightweight XC bike that you've, you know, that linkage design has been done till the cows come home. You know, the one with the flex in the rear seat stays, the old Bear Oif, uh, the Specialized. They've all, they're all using the same now because it's light and it gets rid of one pivot. It gets rid of a set of bearings. And anyway, for that race, not very technical track. I guess the riders wanted simplicity and a bit more stiffness, a bit better power transfer. So Cervelo kind of developed this, I think it was 3D printed or laser sinted aluminium, but they've developed a, what I call a wishbone and then stuck it in place with a shock. So it just locks out that linkage and it can't move. I quite like that. I think it's quite, I think that's quite novel. And uh, it'd be cool if they start offering that as customers. So you buy basically two bikes in one. You get a hardtail and you get a suspension shock for the gnarlier stuff. Now, if you're going bikepacking or doing some marathon events, you probably maybe want to have it as a hardtail. Save a bit of weight, add a bit of simplicity. Save a bit of suspension, Bob. Get a bit more joules per second out of yourself to the pedals. I'm not sure if they're going to offer it to the public, but I really do like that. I think that's quite cool. They could go one step further and add a middle ground of some sort of like, I'm going to say elastomer because we've used elastomer suspension before in the 80s, but like a semi kind of compliant fixed link with some flex and damping in it. So a hybrid between the fully fixed out wishbone, the fully rigid wishbone and the air shock. That'd be quite a cool middle ground. So yeah, kudos to Cervelo for doing that and uh, their first full suspension mountain bike ever, I think that was, so pretty cool to see. 
So anyway, that wraps up the truth show for this time. I uh, really hope the quality's been okay and the wind noise hasn't been too bad. I am on the road, so I can't just dawdle around at walking pace and I am wearing a quite expensive lapel mic, so uh, I really hope I've improved things. The patrons and I are planning a big tire test soon. So you'll see on bicyclerollingresistance.com a big library of tires. We're gonna try and replicate that outdoors using the CDA sensor in a fixed CDA mode. So all we vary then is CRR. I've got a load of tires being delivered. Uh, I'm gonna block out a good week <laughs> or a week's worth of weekends to do all this testing, put it like that. So hopefully we get some dry and consistent weather, some dry roads, consistent CRR, and we'll, we'll see which tires come out on top and see if they correlate to the, the drum testing that they do on bicyclerollingresistance.com. Would really make a difference if you could smash that sub button. Otherwise I'll send salad fingers after you. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next one.